Uh, yeah, so Melina mentioned the uh, NAR survey that was conducted in uh, 2011. There was also one done in 2004. Um, it was a survey of about 2,000 respondents uh, across the entire country. Um, and you know, unfortunately, there were not enough respondents that you could come to any reasonable conclusions about Kansas City using the survey data itself. But what we thought we would try to do is uh, come up with another way to kind of localize the results and take the results from this national survey and, and apply them to, to local areas. And um, the way we went about doing this is that we relied on uh, Esri, which is a, a software publishing company, but they also do a lot of demographic research. And what they have done is they've um, classified basically everyone in the country into 60, one of 65 different tapestries, they call them. Uh, and they're essentially just market segments. And in order to, to uh, put, people, put people in these categories, they look at a variety of data sources. They look at age, income, uh, the family type that you're living in, the race. Um, and, and this data is used by a lot of people, uh, not just for real estate purposes, but it's also used by retailers to, to kind of determine who their best customers are, where are they getting the best um, you know, results. And, and just to give you an example of kind of how this works, these are, these are two different uh, tapestries that come up, and one of them the name is Laptops and Lattes, and you can kind of get an idea of you know, those people might do like another version of Suburban Splendor. Um, so that they classified everyone into these 65 groups that are supposedly representative of market segments that, whose behavior should be consistent um, across the entire country. Um, now, what we did is we unfortunately did not have enough uh, respondents that, that we could do the survey based on the tapestries. But what Esri did is they, they've actually grouped all the tapestries into 12 different life modes. And so we were able to use the survey data to basically uh, look at the responses uh, as they relate to smart growth within each of these different life modes. Um, and the ones you want to pay attention to, the ones that are most relevant to Kansas City, are this high society, so affluent, well-educated, married couple homeowners, uh, family portrait, where's that one? Youth, family life, and children. These are Esri's descriptions, not mine. Okay. And, uh, and I believe uh, high hopes. So young households striving for the American dream. These are kind of their pithy descriptions of, of the life moves. And so if we look at Kansas City, if we look at the distribution of households by life mode in Kansas City compared to the rest of the country, you can kind of see how this works. Um, we've included a couple of other cities there as well, just to give you some context. So um, the, the ones that I've got highlighted in red there, those are the, the ones that make up the three uh, largest chunks of the population in Kansas City. So the, the high society, family portrait, and high hopes are the, are the, the biggest uh, chunks in Kansas City. And, and you can see they're actually overrepresented relative to the, the, na the national average. Um, but it's interesting to see in New York, you can see that Global Roots, that's this uh, blue bar here, so a, they have a very high representation there. And uh, the solo acts in Metropolis, these are kind of even more young, urban, single, young professional types. Um, they're very overrepresented in, in New York and even to some extent in Atlanta. Um, but you can see that in Kansas City, it's, it's not really doing any uh, better or worse uh, than the national average uh, in those two groups. So then what we did, and this is still looking at national data, but we um, took the responses from the, the NAR survey uh, that related to smart growth, um, and we basically came up with a response rates that you know, prefer smart growth within each life mode. And this is, this is question eight. So this is asking, um, you know, would you prefer a home built on a larger lot, but you have to drive to get to schools, stores, and restaurants, or would you prefer a home on a smaller lot and, and maybe be able to walk to some of those things. <clears throat> and you can see the different preference rates. So perhaps as you would expect from the Metropolis and the Solo Axe, these are the more young professional single types. Um, they have the highest preference rate for community for the smaller lots. Um, but you can see that the preference rates don't drop off too dramatically. So uh, even in high society and high hopes, which are very well represented in Kansas City, um, the preference is almost 50%, and in the family portrait, it drops off a little bit, you know, but it's still close to, to 40%. If we look at uh, another question, um, this is, you know, would you prefer to live on a house uh, with a smaller lot uh, and have a shorter commute to work, 20 minutes or less, or would you prefer to live on a larger lot and have a, large, a longer commute? Um, and in general, 
um, preference rates were, were higher for this. Um, and as you can see, although Sobax and Metropolis are still at the top, um, they don't drop off very much until you get to the very bottom. Now it is interesting that Family Poor Group, which is one of the uh, more important ones in Kansas City, uh, is at the bottom of this list, but still 45% of the people in that group uh, would prefer to live on a house with a small lot and have a shorter commute. So it's still a very, very large uh, portion. So going on to another question here, um, this is, you know, would you like to live in a mixed use neighborhood that's more walkable, or would you like to live in a residential only neighborhood and drive to different places? Um, and, you know, perhaps interestingly, the, the family portrait actually jumps up in the rankings here. This is, you know, one that, that is very important for Kansas City. About half of households in that category would prefer to live in a, walk, a walkable kind of mixed use neighborhood. And then uh, one of the last questions here. This is, would you uh, be willing to trade your single family detached house for maybe an apartment or townhouse if it meant living in a walkable neighborhood and also a shorter commute? Um, so once again, the, uh, the, the life modes that are most represented in Kansas City are kind of in the middle of this list, maybe a little bit towards the bottom, but still, uh, you know, you're seeing about 40%. Uh, even in the, in the life modes that are towards the bottom of the list, would still prefer to live in the attached house or the, or the smaller home if you have a walkable neighborhood. So what we did is we, we basically took those preference rates for the life mode within each life mode, and we applied them to the distribution of households by life mode in Kansas City. Um, and this is kind of the result comparing it to a few other different cities and the U.S. average. And what you find is, as you would expect, uh, yes, the preference for smart growth, but you know, calling smart growth the average uh, the responses of those four previous questions. Yes, New York has a higher preference rate, but uh, the difference between New York and Kansas City is perhaps not nearly as dramatic as, as you might think. Uh, and in fact, Kansas City is more or less in line with uh, the national average. So, you know, like I said, this is, this is um, not as good as having a, a poll of Kansas City. Um, or a survey done that's specifically on Kansas City, but this is our way of trying to, to make the national results applicable to uh, Kansas City. And we think, uh, we think the results are, are quite reasonable um, uh, because you know, if you consider that the, the survey was taken over the entire country, not just people in cities, but also rural areas, uh, it's, it's certainly reasonable to think that, that Kansas City would fall somewhere uh, in the middle. So, and thinking about what this might mean for a developer um, that's trying to cater to these audiences, if you, if you basically think that if you, if you take um, the entire audience of people that, that would be interested in smart growth based on that preference by, by life mode, you see that yes, Solax and Metropolis are, are well represented, but because they don't represent a huge portion of the Kansas City population, if you're a developer thinking about smart growth, you probably don't only want to think about them. Um, the, high society groups, the high hugs, the family portrait, these more family, maybe the more traditional uh, kind of homes uh, or households in Kansas City, um, there's a fair number of them out there that, that also would like to see this kind of uh, development. And so that's something to think about when uh, it's potential development. And so the other thing that we looked at is we, we actually looked at, you know, uh, the preference rates by corridor, the, the corridors that Kurt mentioned before. Um, and what we've done here is just kind of a map to summarize. So Esri actually um, classifies each block group as being dominated by a certain life mode or by a certain tapestry. And so we basically applied the average preference rate within each life mode to the block groups uh, identified by Esri. And the darker colors are where you would expect to see more preference for smart growth uh, based on this methodology. And as you can see, um, you know, it it's, it's extends from downtown basically south uh, and somewhat to the west. So that's our work on Kansas City. And then we wanted to talk just a little bit about you know, what this might mean. Um, and to give you an example of, of the work that actually Melina did in Ocala, Florida, um, you know, we broke down the, the, uh, the, the people in Ocala, Florida by age group, and we kind of applied these smart growth preference rates by age group. Um, to figure out what, what kind of, you know, what level of demand is there out there for, for these kind of units. And then we compare that to 
what we thought the supply was, you know, how much supply is there in Elm, Florida that really meets these the smart growth criteria. And in this case, um, you know, we found that there was probably more demand than there actually was supply. And that, that would probably be true in, in Kansas City as well. Um, and that information was then used to uh, help inform their zoning code. And I think what we did is we, we tried to actually identify areas um, in their city where some of the smart growth development could be uh, developed. Uh, and then this last example is, you know, we, we've actually uh, been working a lot in D.C. on housing demand models, looking at a variety of kind of site selection criteria, you know, what are the things that people think about when uh, they're, they're looking for a home. And we show this example to just show you that uh, there's actually a fair amount of demand even in the, uh, the, the inner portions of the city. So it's not necessarily uh, the, the far-flung uh, portions on the edge, but it's also the uh, uh, the portions towards the, the center of the city that have a lot of the amenities that are closer to jobs, you know, th th that's where a lot of people want to live. Um, but of course, one of the issues uh, that you run into with smart growth is that um, not all of these product types are feasible to build. You have to have the market, uh, particularly as you get into, you, know, you talk about more density, you talk about more floors, the construction costs tend to increase, and so you have to have uh, the rents in the market to justify, and that can often be the stumbling point. And this is just an example of uh, some of the land uses that, that we looked at in, in Prince George's County in Maryland. And, and uh, you know, in this case, you know, certain apartment projects, the red represents a negative land value, basically. In other words, a project would, would, would have a negative value, and so uh, you, you could not uh, build it uh, in any kind of a feasible way. Um, and so this is the kind of analysis that if you were Working on this in Kansas City, you would have to be conscious of, you know, what can you, what of these smart growth products can you actually build in a feasible way? Just can you go back to that, just so that yeah. I understand? The pro those are actual projects listed across the bottom, or types of projects? These are types of projects. Yeah. This was just a, a theoretical kind of feasibility model, looking at okay, if you have uh, some certain sites in the county. Um, what kind of what kind of development types could you build? How dense could you really build based on the prevailing uh, market tendencies? Um, 